Coming up on Theater Talk. So was, as part easy. of your process uh, in, in rehearsals, did you have to spend a lot of time watching each other? I mean, of course you do in rehearsals watch well, each other. Well, we've nowhere but... else to go. We're all on stage <laughs> all the time. <laughs> From New York City, this is Theater Talk. I'm Susan Haskins, and I am joined by my co-host, Jesse Green, co-chief theater critic of the New York Times. Hi, Susan. Hi, Jesse. And as we know, there is a wonderful revival of Edward Albee's Three Tall Women now on Broadway, and we are so honored to be joined by all three of the tall women. <laughs> we have Glenda Jackson. You Hello. play A. I do. Laurie Metcalf. B. B. And Allison Pill, the plucky C. <laughs> Welcome to Theater Talk. Yeah. I, as, as Susan just indicated, your character names are a little unusual, A, B, and C. And I wonder, is it fair to say, and any of you jump in and answer this, that despite those different names, you are playing uh, variations or aspects of the same woman? Does that seem a fair way to look at it? Mm -hmm. Well, in as much as... as their ages are markedly different, and their development as human beings, in that sense, is defined for you. Um, but the, one of the really interesting things about the play is how you kind of pick up clues about your character from the others. So was, as part of your process uh, in, in rehearsals, did you have to spend a lot of time watching each other? I mean, of course, you do in rehearsals watch Well, we've other, nowhere but... else to go. We're all on stage <laughs> all the time. <laughs> but was it important to you uh, to identify in each other aspects of this uh, shared character that you would uh, want to use in your own development of your part of the character? Or was it more important to separate yourselves? Or did you not even think along those terms? Well, well the play is in two parts, yeah. so we morph into the, 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 the one character in the second half. The first half, as I recall, yeah. in the rehearsal room gave us the most trouble, mm -hmm. finding those relationships. Mm -hmm. But Joe Mantello, our director, mm -hmm. early on also did want to um, look occasionally for a gesture maybe that was similar between the three, and then repeat it in the second act yeah. again not to help the audience figure out where we've gone, who, we, who we've evolved into by the second half, but I think just those little tiny callbacks must be a, kind of fascinating for an audience to, to watch. And they're just very gentle and go by. You're like, oh, I've seen that little penguin walk you know, before. Where was that? Oh yeah, that, I remember that. So did you think of the, while working on the first act, as, uh, as if it were a separate play from the second act? particularly for your two characters, B and C, who you could say they change the most between the first act and the second act. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, because we're different people. The tricky thing about the first part is how realistic to have made it. It's deceptively realistic language. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. deceptively a realistic situation of this homemade and this you know, lawyer in the same room with this old woman, but it's not it's heightened, it's not reality. The second part, because it is all in this kind of fantastical limbo, mm -hmm. and we are all very clear on who we are, um, which is the same woman, <laughs> the clarity of that was obvious kind of from the beginning, I mean, from the first yeah, read. Absolutely. It hasn't, not that it hasn't changed and morphed as we've gotten to know each other and been able to call back you know, gestures between us and hear the echoes from the first part, but yeah. I wouldn't say they're separate plays because it is all one. But, um, but it was much harder to deal with that, that deceptive realism. He uses such very simple words, and he uses them constantly. And he structures sentences in completely different ways, but still using the same words. And we found it, I'm, I think my, <laughs> my colleagues will agree, absolutely exhausting. It's a play with virtually no physical <laughs> extension at all, but we were absolutely exhausted because your brain is constantly on this treadmill. Because, y you know, the, I mean, well, I still do it. I sometimes chew up, but nonetheless, you know, you think, I've just said that, haven't I? I, I just, <laughs> no, no, I didn't say that. And so 
of the repercussions of that, I mean, I know it sounds ridiculous, but I mean, they're quite profound no. oh, when you're no. actually no. trying to find the character, do you know what I mean? And the relationship with the other characters. And that was really, really tough. Does chew up mean forget? Yeah. 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 Or mangle is another word. Yeah, well, you have, uh, You know uh, what mangling does. Yes. They <laughs> save me every time I've chewed up a Oh, mangle, no. I think you loop me. right back around no, and no. found where but, you but were no, and I've gone right back. Yeah. Yeah. Now, because you have what is a huge, almost monologue in the first well, but part. We all do. You all oh, do, in the first part. Yeah. In the first part. No, in the second. first part. In the first part. Yeah. There were times, I mean, I'll, Mr. Albee's no longer around to check on you. C could you just chew up and go off and it wouldn't matter? What do you mean, Who, chew up and go well, off? I mean, what mean, I'm go saying, off the stage? You, no, 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 no. If, you're, if, you, if you get lost in your lines and... <laughs> well, as I say, they save me. Yeah, they they, they always come up with something. Then I yeah. think, oh, I know. Yeah, I know where I am now. Thank you, ladies. But, yeah. but that is a kind of realism at the same time. I mean, if, if you actually listen to the way we speak in real life, um, and I'm also thinking of the way uh, my grandparents spoke at a certain point. Uh, th that kind of cycling was quite realistic and yeah. uh, doesn't make it trap, easier to memorize. Or I mean, that's I mean what Alison said. Yeah. That is the yeah. trap of the first. What we think of the first act. It is not realistic. It isn't real in that sense. Realism. I mean, there is a reality to it, of course, but. It can delude you into thinking that it's I realistic see. in that way, and it, it isn't. I found the first act, probably you also, Alison, really difficult because mm. our characters are there to serve A, and she's telling us stories. And I, I, my character has heard them a million times. Mm -hmm. and, and so there was trying to find that fine line about when am, when am I listening, when am I not, when am I supplying answers to things that I've heard over and over again? Because at first, we were very yeah, wary. Yeah, we were just attentive. Uh, we were just being attentive. Just, you know, very still, listening, hanging on every word. And then, as a group, we decided, well, it's not really the reality of the scene. And so, what happens if there, you, can you, can you play a game of solitaire? and still be doing your job and not be taking away from the scene, but adding to the experience for the audience of, oh, they, you know, Like the importance of the tedium. Yeah. You know, like that's the real, you cannot enter into the second part until you've experienced yourself going like, again? <laughs> because that is how we deal with old people. We want them to shut up and go away. <laughs> you know, for the most, like you're just like, ugh, fine. But then you peel back that layer of, you know, kind of doddering old lady, and there's this vital, amazing, brilliant, ambitious woman underneath it who's been there the whole time and I think that's the, that journey of the play and how important it is to be able to do, be trying to write I, off this woman for you know because in the first part you're kind of mean kind of and that, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> you are abusing I, I say my my mother is well into her 90s and I'm watching your character and thinking thank God my mother's not like that you know, she's a kindly old lady but you're giving everybody I guess that's Albie's mother that he's portraying. A very bad time. Well, he says, a frontispiece yeah. he wrote to yeah. the script that we've worked on, that I'm, I'm paraphrasing here the last three lines, that during her life, his mother's life, he, and as we know, he was adopted, during his mother's life, he never met anyone who liked her. <laughs> he never met anyone who saw the play who disliked her. What have I done? Yes. <laughs> Were you at all interested in uh, bringing into your work any of the, bi the actual biography of Albie's mother, or was everything you needed in the words that he provided in the text? Everything's in the text. But it's also, I mean, everything's in the text, and that was their life. So knowing that you didn't really have to do uh, external work. No, I just find it really grounding when you know that every line that they're saying in different at, at different ages yeah. happened and was told to even even Edward. the bracelet story i assume so i presume i'm not going absolutely. to let uh, viewers I, know what that story I'm is they'll sure. have to get it for I'm, themselves I'm sure I, ima <laughs> I imagine all of it is yeah absolutely the affair true. with the groom yeah speaking from <laughs> the audience perspective i i the the um 
social interaction that you, you were describing uh, of uh, not just um, sort of serving this uh, woman, A, but having your own lives that are reacting with it like in boredom or annoyance or whatever it might be, is where the audience gets to have a great deal of fun, which is a long-winded way of saying it's a comedy among many other things. I I've rarely laughed out loud so much at a basically tragic vision uh, of, uh, of a woman's life and of human aging. Did you have to think about it as a co comedy in that way, or did you let that all arise from doing the work of finding these, these women? Well, you hope you get the laughs. I mean, your greatest educator teacher is an audience, yeah. and, and they tell you whether you've got it right or not. But the inherent humor in it, I mean, is there. I mean, it's just, you know. Well, uh, that's why they, they, like your, obvious. They, they like your mother, but not his real mother, because you have the great jokes. Well, yeah. I, I mean, I would imagine that she had those great Thank, jokes, yeah. too. Yeah. I mean, one of um, uh, members of the cast, I mean, knew uh, I'll be worked with him a lot and, and knew his mother. And clearly she was, I mean, she was a popular social, you know, butterfly in, in her own particular strata of society. And we see it now. I mean, you know, you see people where they're standing is such that they really only ever meet the same kind of people and that was the world that she inhabited yes. and they were they could be quite viciously funny i think <laughs> uh this is a a play about a woman or several women by a man uh laurie you recently played um nora nora in the doll's life Part two. Doll's um, House. Doll's House. Sorry, I'm thinking of the musical yes. sequel called Doll's House. <laughs> that he doesn't Life. want to sorry. think about. Sorry. Slightly different. <laughs> very, very sorry for that. <laughs> Doll's House Part Two. <laughs> You've played Mary Tyrone in uh, Long Day's Journey. Um, other, those are other great female roles written by men. And you've also recently been in a movie uh, with a great female role written by a woman. And I, Allison was in Blackbird. Oh, my God. Uh, um, Talk about uh, female roles. Written by and then, men. and we can also weave into this discussion the uh, King Lear that Miss Jackson recently did. The kernel of a question in here is, uh, given that these are individual males, not not all males, uh, that have written these parts, and an individual woman, not all women, is it still possible to see a difference in the way a woman creates a female character and the way uh, the men who have written those other plays did? Does that make any sense? As None a whatever. I yeah, don't think I, that I, I, I could could've. see that you weren't going. That's yeah. a tough one. I don't think <laughs> that in the three that you mentioned for me, I don't think that I could have 100% said this is written by either a man or a woman. I don't think that I could. Lady Bird, maybe that one. I would have ventured to guess that that was. <laughs> oh, I was. By I was seeing clips of it yesterday. <laughs> I certainly think that cries out, written by a woman. <laughs> yeah, well, it was very personal, yeah. and uh, all of the characters in that movie were so three-dimensional and, and... Well, that's what I mean, the authenticity of, yeah. of, of the writing. Uh, not that the Albi is not authentic. And I guess that's the thing, is that while looking at, looking at this play in particular, he has studied and been obsessed with his mother, but he's also studied and been obsessed with himself. Mm. And ah. that self-knowledge mm. that comes through, I mean, his maturity in dealing with his mother is something I don't think 99% of humans are capable of. Well, I don't know you that know, he was either. I mean, he is in the play, <laughs> but if you... I don't but that's know. Right. No, I don't think... But right. I mean, just the, the ability to write about it yes. in, this, in that kind of mature way. Do I think... I mean, he was also, you know, somebody impossible to get along with from the, most people's uh, perspectives. And mm -hmm. also, again, viciously funny and... So I think, I mean, I think all of this to say, I think it does come down to the individual and I think it does come down to writing these personal things. And so you could say Lady Bird couldn't be written by a man. Of course it couldn't. No. Because a man didn't grow up in Sacramento with, you know, like, like well, I don't, wasn't a teenage girl. Carrying on this idea because you mentioned Laurie doing Long Day's Journey and for which she justifiably ever regretted her ever didn't see it, but she got absolutely rave notices for doing it. But there's O'Neill who is writing a play about his family mm -hmm. and absolutely defines the errors, the faults that caused that family to be the way it was. He had that knowledge of his own family and he proceeded to recreate it for himself. He learned absolutely nothing when it came to his own family. Yes. I mean, it was another mishmash. I mean, it was, you know, 
terrible disasters. So there's something here which is really, really fascinating in one sense that you know and you learn absolutely nothing. I think there's a, a false notion somehow that plays uh, better the author by uh, allowing them to express and get rid of their demons, but it doesn't seem mm -hmm. in these great plays like they actually do get rid of them, but they just clarify them for other people. They can share them with us. I mean, we can see them, but they are still left on that lonely desert island. But then that's true of everybody who's a creative spirit, isn't it? I mean, just think about it. You're a writer. Well, you know, and that blank page stretches to infinity, doesn't it? Oh, you yes. Know, or, or, you know, you're a composer. I mean, those yeah. five lines, God, do they ever end? No. no. A canvas, where is its edges? Whereas we, who are privileged to work in plays, we may not have an absolutely detailed map, but at least we vaguely know the borders. Being a writer seems so courageous in a certain sense. I mean, I know they're com the great ones are compelled to do it, but what a lonely, frightening place it can be. Well, absolutely. Well, absolutely. You worked with Edward Albee. Uh, we were just talking about his... I was in a play which he He directed, that's what direct. I mean. It's not quite <laughs> the same thing. Would you tell us about that? Not quite the same thing. Because we were, she was discussing how his reputation, but you experienced it. He was, with all due respect, a completely enclosed human being. Mm. He, I, I mean, you can't walk in a glass case, can you? But there was absolutely <laughs> no absolutely no kind of human interchange and of course I blew it on the first day of rehearsal because the couple come back and they're drunk and uh, it's Virginia Woolf right yeah, Virginia Woolf right me and John Lithgow come on to wherever we were rehearsing and um, it, it, I'll be said um, and you know she she should I'm paraphrasing again um, she should stumble I mean she's got to put her coat down I said hang on a minute doesn't she live here she'd know where the light switch was wouldn't she <laughs> That was not the right approach to take. But um, in a way, I, I had sympathy for him because, of course, Virginia Woolf was his greatest curse as well as his greatest you know, prize, in a sense, because everything else was compared to that play. And we were doing it in Los Angeles, and, of course, that play then had the Burton and Taylor logo all over oh, it. So yes. for him, you know, I think that was something very difficult. But... I think his honesty in, in the play we're doing is just staggering. I didn't work with him, I wasn't a friend of his, but I interviewed him many times oh, right. later in his life. And, uh, and I think it's relevant to Three Tall Women, uh, my experience, in that as he aged, um, I feel like that glass case he almost wore began to disintegrate. Yes. And something that moves me in Three Tall Women, it, it, aside, it's tragic in a way, I mean, in the way that life is tragic, but there's also something wonderful and brave about the way A uh, begins to accept what's going to, what the next steps are and death. It's a play about death. Mm. Um, and I felt that something wonderful happened to him too. Well, we had the, this really very moving letter that was sent to us, but I think by the chief executive of his trust, wasn't it? Yeah. Who brought to see the play, the woman who had been Albie's carer at the last part of oh, his man. life. And they had this kind of relationship. He would fire her and they'd go, go to extraordinary lengths not to fire her. Anyway, she came to see the play and she was in tears throughout the whole of what we think of as the second act. Um, because, yes, you know, I mean, obviously those kinds of relationships became available to him towards the end of his life. I mean, you mentioned Leah. One of the interesting things for me was when I was a member of parliament, I would visit old people's homes and day centers and things of that nature. And the barriers, the gender barriers, just begin to fray. I mean, the extreme ends of life, I age rather, the older we get, they just become murky and foggy and they split and they break in exactly the same way, you know, when children are born, we teach them that they're boys or girls, don't we? Do you know what I mean? There aren't those gender barriers there. And that's, I think, one of the things that's interesting about age. And in, and in Lear, uh, the fact that it was written as a man becomes unimportant in a way, if you... If you... Well, nobody ever mentioned it. I mean, I have to put it in the context that there have been brave companies in my country who've really taken on the gender bender issue and have fought and I think won that battle, you know, doing all the histories with an all-female cast and mm -hmm. things of that nature, the Shakespearean histories. Um, and nobody ever, ever mentioned it. It was never an issue. No member of the audience said it in any way, shape or form to me. Nobody else did. But then it is, isn't it? 
just a remarkable play. It's such a privilege to be allowed to do it. Quite it would much. seem that the gen gender would be the last interesting issue in that play. Yeah, exactly. Did you work with uh, Albie, or you didn't work with him, but did no, you work uh, on his plays? You've I've never completed. done an Albie play, and I, and I never had uh, the opportunity to meet him. Don't you want to play uh, Martha sometime? Oh, well, who doesn't? Yeah. <laughs> Pick your brain about that, about how uh, intense okay. that must have been. Okay. I don't know if you'd be a good Martha Alice. I'd, I'd see you as a honey. Well. You seem just too nice. Well, now, hang on uh, a minute here. Maybe because later, later. Just a minute. You All said, right. before we came into the studio, yes. you justifiably heap praise on her performance. Yes, okay? I did. Right? Yes, I did. And that's what everybody does. Everybody says how marvelous she is. Yeah. Um, we, uh, to go back to when I did Virginia Woolf, um, Cynthia Nixon's understudy came to see the play the other night. Now, she was the original C in the first production at the English language theater in Vienna all those years ago. And I said to her, because she'd been, you know, there with us in Virginia Woolf, I said, did he manage to crack a smile at you or anything? This is all we yes. talking about. No, she said, no, but he gave me notes. And I said, oh, that's interesting. What was it? I can't remember the second one he gave her. The first one was, I don't want the audience to like her. Interesting. And the, you, you are very... Go to work on that. To the extent, and I don't want to caricature actors, but to the extent that there's a natural tendency to please audiences, mm. it must be useful to be freed from that by being told... Oh, no, it's more subtle than that. I mean, A, I don't actually agree with you that we want audiences to like us. We want them to listen, and we want them to laugh in the right places and be quiet in the right places. We don't necessarily <laughs> want us to like them, like us, but, I mean, that... That is a profoundly important thing, to, I think, to say to some to an actress. I don't want the audience to like her. Do you agree, Laurie Metcalf? What I find Absolutely. really fascinating is, uh, like, take A's character. Yeah. The more abusive that she is, yes. uh, obviously, it's super funny. Yes. And yes. but but it's also weirdly endearing to me in a way that she's she's alienating mm. everybody mm. and just plowing forward, mm -hmm. plowing mm -hmm. forward. And we see, you know, how she is going to be uh, mm. at the very end mm. with her son who's kissing her for the chauffeur and the maid. Mm. Um, and she's aware that she's doing it mm -hmm. and still and can't stop. And doesn't and care. So, and I think that the, uh, and, and doesn't care. Doesn't and, care. And the audience, I, th I think, finds it um, it, 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 it makes an audience sympathetic, mm. I think. Mm. That's a trick. Yeah, well, you know, as he you, said, you, you know, you never met anyone who saw the play who didn't like, who, who, who disliked it. Yeah. I mean, so, just, Now, I saw the play originally, and Marion Seldes played your part mm -hmm. so radically different. I mean, mm. the wonderful Mar Marion Seldes, but you come at it from a radically different perspective. Yeah, I wouldn't know because right, I haven't see seen it, it and uh, really I, I, should, I should go look it up uh, after our run yeah. uh, <laughs> run around Center sneakers. because I know that there is a Yeah, she a didn't run around in sneakers and wasn't, she didn't have your thing. Your, 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 the, your, your, well, you know, knowing, I think that uh, w w because we are going to morph, you know, later in the second half, that kind of an acting challenge was, well, how different can I be then? Let's work backwards. Mm -hmm. So if I know I'm going to look like this in the second half, what would be the extreme opposite of that? So and, and not only your clothes, but you're the, very casual. Yeah, the body language. Body language, and yeah. then you are so different because you're so buttoned up, right? Mm -hmm. In the beginning. Mm -hmm. Now we have we uh, we have the famous one minute left, so I throw <laughs> it to you, and then to. Well, I, <laughs> great. Uh -oh. um, I was just thinking back to you alluded to Peter Brook, and I I've, I read something oh, right. that you wrote uh, that you said about him that. Uh, it, working with him is like coming across an oasis in the desert. Mm -hmm. Like all great directors, he creates the kind of world in which everyone's responsible for the whole play. Absolutely. Um, and that seemed like such a wonderful idea. And uh, I don't know. I w well, it was wonderful to work in that context. You know, I mean, he, he, he all good directors always know what they don't want. And they expect you to show them what they do. And the great thing, one of the great things about him is he never, ever lets you go down the wrong path mm. too, for too long. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of my fellow actors in that original company said, you know, the great thing about him is he just takes you, he stops you going down the wrong path. His favorite word actually is no. <laughs> <laughs> they go, oh no, 
No. So no, there's, a, there's no. the no, which is helpful, um, but there's also a feeling of society or, or of uh, the, the group work that you are all in this together. You're yes, we together. are. I mean, everybody is responsible for the whole piece, whatever it is. It's not dependent on how much you have to say or how little you have to say. So is you are all equally responsible for trying to make whatever it is you're engaged in the best it can possibly be. I mean, actually, Liv Ullman gave me a perfect description of what really good directors can do. She was in a play, she was playing a film, she was playing a very vain woman. She had to walk down a corridor, there was no dialogue. And as she walked down the corridor, she checked her appearance in every reflective image. Mm -hmm. He'd set up a camera where if she chose to do that, he got it. That's perfect, ain't it? Mm -hmm. Ain't yep. that the sort of person we all want to work with all the time? Yeah. Well, well there's our perfect minute. And you are all <laughs> in it together in Three Tall Women. Absolutely. A, a magnificent ensemble performance. And that guy, I'm not going <laughs> to... <laughs> but... <laughs> But it's just wonderful, and I, and I really appreciate you all coming. Alison Pill, Glenda Jackson, and Laurie Metcalf, thank you for coming back. No, oh, thank you. It's lovely to see you. Thank, thank you. you, Jesse thank you. Green. Thank you, Susan. <laughs> this mutual admiration society. Yes. Our thanks to the Friends of Theatre Talk for their significant contribution to this production. Theatre Talk is made possible in part by the Frederick Lowe Foundation, the Corey and Bob Dinelli Charitable Fund, the Noel Coward Foundation, Carrie J. Fries, the Dorothy Strelson Foundation, and the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs. We welcome your questions or comments for Theater Talk. Thank you.